see the waterfalls and the steam rising up. And there's beautiful things that you can hear in Indiana about our sunsets. I really believe that. I really believe that creation is crazy. It, leads, it shows us. It shows us praise to God. It's awesome. Um, I've got a handful of announcements here. Um, I'm going to do them in this order. Ladies Tea, remember that March 16th is Saturday at 1 o'clock. And uh, if you need any information about that, see Cindy Soden. We've got the sign-up sheet. And is that over at the welcome table? Or is that with you? That's with you. So see Cindy if you haven't signed up for that yet. And help her. She needs some helpers for things. She's got different tasks if you want to help out with that. Not just go to it, but help out with it. Um, she's got jobs for you to do. So be sure and see her after worship for that. I got everything, right? Okay, good. Um, uh, next gathering on Sunday night is going to be this next coming Sunday, not tonight, the next one, 5.30 to 7.30. We're going to do pickleball in here. We haven't done pickleball yet. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And so we'll have that. And we also always have the multi-purpose room in here open. And we'll play some cards and stuff in there and some board games. Just have a good time. Have snacks. Uh, we've got the green room open over here if you want to quiet place and pray. Uh, we've had two gatherings so far and it's been fantastic. So uh, if you can come next Sunday for that, be sure to come to that. Uh, kitchen help. So if you could help out, uh, we could use some, uh, a few extra hands after worship. Um, if you would like to uh, help out, we just need some help like sweeping up the floor, taking out the trash, for that to be somebody's thing or a few people's thing. So if you can help out with that, uh, just let us know. Uh, let Cassandra know. Uh, let Gwen and I know. We'll point you in the right direction. Really easy stuff there, but we could use a little bit of extra help with that. Um, blessing box, we still need stuff. Where's Debbie at? Do we still need some stuff for blessing box? Okay. Um, and you can get with Debbie because she might probably let me know what we need more of, but we're still uh, trying to gather some more stuff for that, which is a great way to help people out over here. So, uh, and when you do bring stuff up, you can just set it on that white table. In fact, I see it back there right now in the corner. So that's where you can put it. If you want to bring it up here during the week, just get, just shoot when I text, let us know. Uh, you can bring it straight to the office. That's where the closet's at, where we keep all the blessings box up anyway. So, uh, you can do that. And then, I think, okay. Okay, last and most important, two more baptisms uh, this past weekend. Uh, we got the pictures up, right? Do we have pictures? We do? Okay, yeah, we throw those pictures up there. Uh, Cheryl Harper was baptized on Thursday. Yes. And uh, they're not here this morning because they wanted to see their son Dustin, so they're over there with him. But uh, when you see her next week, be sure to give her a hug right over here. And then after that, on Saturday, yesterday, Bethany Hoffman was baptized. So, uh, <laughs> Um, and hey, a lot of people that have been baptized here recently have been baptized before. Um, I don't want to tell you who, because it's up to them, but, but if you've been, I don't know how many of you might have had, maybe your heart might be more than their hearts was, you're like, just, you feel like God's put down your heart. I think I, when I first made that decision, where I'm at now, I just want to make and that's totally fine. In fact, we're going to, I'm going to do a whole lesson on being baptized again next week. So, uh, you know one of the things that Cheryl Harper told us, and she said, man, let, me, let this be a, a, a testament that you can never be too old. Uh, so I thought that was really cool hearing her say that. So, uh, let's go ahead and stand. That's all we've got. And uh, Lily and Karen, you guys got our scripture reading. Let me go ahead and pray for us. We'll our scripture reading. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, holy be your name. Thank you for being here with us. You of all beings, God, help us to know you're here. Help us to remember that you are a God who chooses to be with his children. Help us to remember that you're not a billion light years away, although you are a billion light years away. 
there's a way, because you are everywhere and you are in everything, but that means you are here, God. You are here with us. Not just your presence, but you're with us here in heart because we are singing praise to you. We are glorifying your name. We're drawing near to your table and uh, preaching your word. <clears throat> you are here because of your love for us. Help us to remember that in everything we do. Um, help us to remember that. So Jesus, we pray. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know his love, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Woo, tuck that one in your heart. And you want to memorize scripture, memorize that. <laughs>
heaven. I can't wait. I've got a friend.
Good morning, church. How are you guys? Good. Good. Hands. We all have them, right? They come in different sizes, big, small. You know what they say about people who have big hands? They wear big gloves. <laughs> so that's your dad joke for the day. Um, but these things, they're our best tools that we have. I just want you to take a look at your hands for a second. Think about what you've done with them, what, what you do with them on a daily basis. And, you know, think about, if we didn't have them, it would be pretty difficult to live without them. But some people, however, some people do. Now, keep looking at your hands and think about some of the amazing things you've done with them. So, I'll give you a couple examples. I, you know, in this hand, there are both hands, all six of my kids fit in them. All, I have adult kids now. I, I just realized I did like the Lion King sort of live <laughs> thing. But, it, you know, they fit in here. You know, some other things that I've done in my life, I, you know, when I was in college, I pinch pressed 500 pounds with my hands. Well, not just with my hands, but they were, it was in my hands. Some amazing things. So keep looking at your hands and think about some of the bad things you've done with your hands. Because we all have. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I punched first people before, you know, struck them in anger, and I used my hands. That's part of it, it's part of life. I regret regret doing it, but I did. Um, so we have these hands, and we use them for good, and we use them for bad. Our hands are powerful tools that we use every single day. To me, that's amazing. How many of you have used your hands and healed somebody? I don't see any hands, so. Um, I haven't either. We all know someone who has, and that's Jesus, right? He also loved us so much that he sacrificed himself on the cross with nails going through his healing hands. Um, there's a couple of scriptures, and I'm just taking this out of Matthew 8. And just one chapter in Matthew 8, there, I'm going to give you three examples of of Jesus healing people, healing with his hands. So the first one is um, the man with the leprosy. And he said, uh, it says, a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you're willing to make me clean, well, Lord, we can, can you make me clean? Jesus, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him, touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean, and immediately he was clean, clean of leprosy. The second one is the centurion. Centurion's uh, servant was ill, and the centurion came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, said to the centurion, Go, let it be done, just as you believe it would. And his servant was healed in that moment. And then the last one I, I'll, I'll say is uh, Jesus was at Peter's house, his mother in law was ill with a fever. Um, Peter's mother was lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever and, and the fever left her. And she got up and began to wait on him. I thought that was I thought that, that just in one chapter of one book of the Bible, there's three examples. There's many other examples, too. I came across this poem. I tried to find the author, but I couldn't find the author. Um, it's called In the Hands of Love. And it says, in the hands of love, in, in the hands of Jesus, my burdens subside. His touch, a balm on my weary soul applied. With gentle care, he wipes my tears away. In his hands, I find solace every day. His hands, scarred and marked, tell a story divine of sacrifice, redemption, his love intertwined. They cradle the broken, heal the wounded heart. In his hands, I find strength, a brand new start. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, for your healing hands. Thank you for your sacrifice, leading yourself to that cross. Having the, those healing hands nailed to the cross so we can be forgiven for our sins. And in one day, walk hand in hand with you. For it's in the strong name I pray.
got a great story in Acts chapter 10. We're going to look through a lot of it. Start in verse 1, it says, At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who had come to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel of God who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to job. If you've been reading through the book of Acts and you come to this story, you know something really big is about to happen. You know something good is about to happen. Because you can see God at work. And what's amazing here, though, is that we're dealing with somebody who is not, if you were living during that day and age, you understand the huge gap that stood between Jew and Gentile, your ears might perk up a little more when you realize that this guy named Cornelius happens to be a centurion. That means that he was not just a Roman soldier, but he was a high up Roman soldier, one in charge of a hundred other soldiers. This guy didn't grow up in Jerusalem. He didn't grow up uh, with the Torah and the Tanakh and the Old Testament scriptures that the Jewish people did. But Luke tells us something really important about him and his family. It says he was devout and god feared This is a man who is seeking God. So he gets this incredible vision. And so he, he takes of his guys, and he sends them off to Joppa to find this guy named Simon Peter. Verses 9 through 23, about noon, the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, so you got to picture these three guys are drawing near to the city that God is leading them to, and it's in that city that Simon Peter already is. So it says, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And that can happen sometimes when you're trying to spend time alone with God, right? And all of a sudden you're like, oh, now I realize I'm hungry. So, uh, it says, while the meal was being prepared, oh, Michael, there's the problem. You're up on the roof and the sense just rising, right? So there's food going on here, but then all of a sudden things get really interesting with food because it says he falls into a trance. So he sees this vision. So Cornelius has a vision, and that's what sends these guys to job where Peter's at. And while those guys are getting close to the city, God sends Peter a vision. This is the Peter, or this is the vision Peter gets. He saw heaven opened, which always makes me think, because we read in scripture about heaven being opened from time to time. I'm like, what does that look like? Well, he sees heaven open, and something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. Okay. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Alright. So you're like, okay, this is kind of weird. Uh, there's a sheep with a bunch of animals, and this voice is telling Peter to get up and kill and eat, like, okay, kind of odd, right? Here's the thing you guys see there. It says it contained what kinds of animals? All kinds. Okay, to the Jewish mind, do you see where there's a problem there? Peter's like, 
Uh, um. <laughs> and it's interesting because whose voice is he hearing? He's hearing God's voice. Tell him to do something. He's like, eh, breaks. And we saw the same thing last week when we were looking at Paul's conversion. And God comes to Ananias and he's like, I want you to go. This guy's Saul. He, he's, he's blind. I want you to go pray over him. He's waiting for you. And Ananias is like, um. I just, it's interesting how often godly people are told to do something by God. And they're like, uh, I don't know. Or they're like, no. Uh, so anyways, surely not, Lord. Peter replied, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. That's the big word. That's the key word. When it comes to the Jews and their food laws, what they eat is clean. The foods that they are not allowed to eat is unclean. The people that eat those kinds of foods are Gentiles. Those people are unclean too. So you can see where this is going. Because this guy over in Caesarea, who's a centurion, happens to be a what? Gentile. You see what God's doing here? He's telling Peter to eat food that Peter's never eaten before. He's like, no way, I've never done that. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. So church, you see right away. It's, it's about food, but it's not really about food as much. It's about people. And that's going to come up later on. I love this verse 16. I love this part of the story. It says, this happened three times, and immediately the sheep was taken back to you know what's the neat thing I thought about this week as I was looking at this scripture? Peter never did what he was told to do there. You know, it says it happened three times. So that means three times the sheet's here. Three times God says, get up, Peter, kill me. And three times Peter's like, no, I can't. I can just can't. Uh, but anyways, I think Peter gets the message as you continue to read the story. So verse 17, while Peter was still wondering about the meaning of the vision, and I would imagine a Jewish man would be wondering a whole lot of things, when God, who told them what is clean and what is unclean to eat, is telling him, eat what he thinks is unclean. So, sometimes we experience this too, when God might put something on our heart, and we're like, ah, and we're wrestling with it. So, he's on the roof, he's woke up, and he's just thinking. He's, he's like, what, what could that mean? What could that mean? While he's thinking that, while he's wondering about the meaning of it, the men sent by Cornelius, those three guys, they found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out and asked Simon, who was known as Peter, to stay there. They're asking, like, is he here? While Peter was still thinking about the visions, you see, this is where his headspace is. The Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. I like to pause there because it sounds a little bit creepy, right? <laughs> like, there are three men looking for you. Like, uh oh. <laughs> like, what's the Spirit going to leave you here? Like, I'm in trouble, I need one. No, and verse 20 says, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. And I love how the Spirit of God gives him that note there, because when Peter goes down and sees three Gentile men, he probably would have hesitated when they say, hey, you need to come with us. So the Spirit of God leads him. Uh, let's see, where was I at? Um, he goes, so verse 21, Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. That's a pretty cool detail right there because I'm willing to bet not every Roman centurion is respected by the Jewish people. That says a lot about Cornelius' character, doesn't it? A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. So we're starting to see the pieces come together. We're seeing the vision that God gave Cornelius and the vision that God gave Peter and these three men showing up. All this stuff is happening, and the interesting thing is, don't you think about this, because we're going to come back to it. Somebody's orchestrating something here. Somebody is taking these pieces and bringing them together. So verse, the second part of verse 23 through verse 29, the next day Peter started out with them and some of the believers from Joppa went along. So Peter brings a few of the believers that are already Christian with him along. It's always nice to have some, some of your own people. Maybe there's a part of Peter that's like, okay, Lord, I'll go with these three Gentiles, but I'm bringing some of my Jewish Christian friends here just so I feel like i got somebody in my corner just in case. I don't know. The following day, 
He arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. So now we got more people involved here than just Cornelius. We got Cornelius' family. We got Cornelius' friends. They've all come because God's arranged this incredible thing. As Peter entered the house, I love this part, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. How many of you would feel comfortable if somebody did that to you? Like, and that's exactly what Peter does. Peter made him get up, stand up. He said, I'm only a man myself. <clears throat> While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. I wonder if there's any pause after he says that. I want you to think about this. Why God's doing all this? Because Cornelius gets this vision. He sends these three guys. Peter gets a vision. And, and God, the Spirit of God, he tells him, Peter, I want you to go with these guys because I've sent them. And I really do wonder. Peter, usually the Spirit of God says things to us because we need to hear it. Peter needed to hear God say, okay, I want you to go with them. I'm part of this. And remember this vision Peter had of these unclean animals. And this voice telling him, get up, kill and eat, get up, kill and eat, get up, kill and eat, three times, three times. He was like, no, 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 never done that. And then he ends up at this Gentile's house, and he walks in, and Cornelius bows down, and Peter's like, no, none of that, get up, get up. And the first thing that Peter says to him after that is, you, and think about this crowd of people, they're all Gentiles. These are friends and family members of Cornelius, a Roman centurion. And the first thing Peter says is, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. There's thousands of years of gap between what's happening there and where we sit here today. We, we can imagine, based on what the Bible says, we can imagine the tension and the separation between Jew and Gentile, but I don't think we can fully grasp just how big a deal this was. So the fact that he's crossed the threshold into this guy's house, Jews wouldn't even do that. I'm sorry, yeah, Jews wouldn't do that with Gentiles. No, no. In fact, we're going to see Peter get questioned about this as soon as he's done with this whole encounter. His fellow Jews back home are like, oh, what's going on? That's the first words out of his mouth. Maybe those people are thinking, when Peter goes, you're well aware that I'm breaking some laws here. I, I am breaking, we do not associate with you people. And then the next words out of his mouth are this. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. You see, that sheep with the animals and the unclean food, it's not about food. It's about people. And God was showing Peter through that, my heart is for the Gentile. My heart is not just for the Jew. My heart is for every man, woman, and child that I've created. Every human being. My heart is for them. The gospel of Jesus is for them. Verse 29, so when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent me? And then the next paragraph, Cornelius just explains the vision. He's like, I had this vision, and God told me to send for you, so I sent these three guys to you, and that's why you're here. And so uh, in verse 34... Then Peter began to speak, and I love this line from him. Listen to what he says. He says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favorite. That's such a big line. Man, that, that line matters today. You might go, well, of course, it's in the Bible. Every line in the Bible matters today. But I, I want you to think about that, because I think we live in a culture where it seems like there's some forces that are trying to divide. And I know the older you are in here, you would probably say, that's not new. It's always been there. But it does seem like there's tension sometimes. There's dividing lines between different things. And you're well aware of that living in our culture. And I just love that line right there. When Peter says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. God does not play favorites. God wants every human being to know his love and to know the good news of Jesus. Everybody. Nobody's out on us. That's the, that, that is one of the biggest things about Acts chapter 10. Because before this, like, this is a big branching out to the Gentiles. And you already saw Jesus do some of this. But it's one thing for Jesus to do. It's a whole other thing for his followers. So 
So Acts chapter 10 is all about the church is not just for the Jews. And so from here on, verses 34 through 43, Peter shares the good news of Jesus with them. He talks to them about what Jesus did. He talks about Jesus' death. He talks about Jesus' resurrection. He talks about how they were witnesses of this. And at the end of that, in verse 43, it says, All the prophets testify about him, talking about Jesus, that, this is big, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And listen to what happens in the next paragraph. It's all been, all been leading up to this. While Peter was still speaking these words, and you can go back and read that if you want verses 34 through 43. It's just sharing the gospel message with While he was still speaking those words, that means he didn't finish. Peter had a sermon going on and God interrupted him, which is really cool. I've had God do that to me standing up here before. Some of you may not even notice it, but I knew what happened. I'm like, okay, Lord. So anyways, so while he's still speaking, the Spirit came on all who heard the message. While he was still speaking, the Holy Spirit was poured out on him. It says the circumcised believers, and that's, that's Peter's posse that he brought with him just in case, you know, who had come with Peter were astonished. Think about that word for a moment. That goes to show you, I think, part of this gap between two Gentiles. That when the Holy Spirit gets poured out on all these Gentiles, the Jewish people that Peter brought with them, their feeling when they see this is astonishing. They were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. It's so cool what happens here. Uh, there's something I thought about when I was dwelling on this scripture this week, too. Do you guys remember the story in the Gospels when there's a paralytic that gets lowered through the roof? They have friends come because, of course, you can't do anything. And this paralytic gets lowered through the roof. And as soon as that paralytic gets down to where Jesus is at, do you remember Jesus' first words to this guy? Who, what, what, what's the reason, by the way, do his friends bring him to Jesus? What's the point of all this? It's so they can be healed. So he gets lowered through the roof, and the first words to, to this guy by Jesus are what? Sins are Your sins are forgiven. It's like, okay, that's great, for sure. I mean, that's big, and we all know that's actually bigger than the physical problems that we have. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law that were there were like, who's this guy think he is? And then Jesus says this. He said, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, or get up and walk. If you're dealing with somebody who's paralyzed, and then you get the point of this, right? Because like, if you're paralyzed, I can say, your sins are forgiven, but who can see that? How can, how, what's the physical manifestation of those sins being forgiven? And so Jesus says that I want you to know, I want you to know, he's talking to those Pharisees who are doubting that he can forgive sins. I want you to know the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. And then he tells the paralytic, now I tell you. Get up and walk. As soon as he gets up and walks, there's all the proof you need that Jesus is who he says he is, and he has the authority to fix it. I thought of that story when I was thinking of this, because it says while Peter was still preaching, while he was still speaking to them about Jesus, the Spirit gets poured on these people. And a lot of times when you read through Acts, if you remember Acts chapter 2, people were cut to the heart, and they were like, what should we do? And remember Peter's response to them? Repent, be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Usually it seems like the Spirit is coming after the baptism. The baptism hasn't even happened yet. Do you see what happened here? Why did the Spirit of God, what do you think, what do you think? Why do you think the Spirit of God chose to pour himself out on those Gentiles before Peter was even done speaking, before they had even been baptized, if not for God to show Peter and those Jews with them, I am in this. I am doing this. These are my children. These people are part of the family of God now. These people are welcome in. Rather than it being initiated just by Peter's preaching or just by the baptism itself, the Spirit, it's so cool because I was reading that, I'm like, I think the Spirit like just jumped ahead, I'm like, I'm going to jump ahead of you here because I want you to see that I'm 
commandments. So this whole series we've been in has been on baptism, and the reason, of course, we're looking at this story this morning is because it all kind of culminates there at the end with the baptism of Cornelius and his family and the friends that he invited to his house that day. I want to look at some really important things about this story that I think we can take home. First thing is that these two guys are a world apart. Do you notice what a world apart these guys are? You've got Peter, who's from Jerusalem. That's where he's been. Uh, that's where he goes back to. Now, when they, when they sent for him, he was in Joppa. But his hometown right now is Jerusalem. That's where he's from. What do we know about Jerusalem? Jerusalem is kind of the center of Judaism, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's home base for Jews. That's where the temple is, right? So the one city that is like the city for the Jewish people is Jerusalem. It's, it's the capital of Judaism. And then Peter also is a Jew himself, now, I would say, at this point, it's all very clear. His primary identity is following of Jesus. His primary identity is a Christian. But he has a Jewish background. He has Jewish ancestry. He has Jewish blood in his veins, right? And Peter is a church leader. He's one of the pillars, Paul would say, of the early church. That's what we know about him. Then we have this guy named Cornelius. Cornelius is from what city? You guys are cheating because you're looking at the screen. Yeah, he's from Caesarea. All right, so we'll just take the last two letters off the name of that city. So think about where these two guys are coming from. Peter's coming from the capital of Judaism. Cornelius is living in Caesarea, a city that is named after the leader of the Roman people, Roman Empire. Peter is a Jew with Jewish blood and Jewish ancestry. Cornelius is a Gentile with Gentile blood, Gentile ancestry. Peter is a leader in the church. Cornelius is a leader of Rome. And we all know the Jewish people were not too keen on the Roman Empire parked in their backyard, taxing them, telling them what to do. Do you see? I want you to see this as best as we can today. I don't think we can fully grasp just how different what it was like then. These two guys are a world of work. These two do not belong in the same room together. So, so the world defines them. So as the world says. They don't belong in the same room. They don't even belong on the same block. They don't belong in the same city. To the Jews, the Gentiles could be on the other side of the world, and they'd be fine with it. In fact, some of them might feel better if they're not even on the world at all. That's how big of a gap there was. Okay? How in the world do these two end up together? How in the world does a Jewish Christian church leader from Jerusalem end up at the house, at the table of a Roman military Gentile leader in Caesarea of all places. Now, you know the answer to that question, right? Only God. Only God. Not, no, 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 listen, not, not, you know, they, they had some things that they did, and then God kind of came in along the side and helped nudge them along a little bit. No! Only God. That's how these two ended up together. Who sends men to Joppa? Let's follow this question. Let's see who is doing what here. Who, sent, who sends the men to Joppa? Who does that? Uh, yeah, I know they go to God. Well, Cornelius does, but it's because he gets a vision from God. So who's the catalyst for that whole thing? And then who gives Peter the vision of the unclean animals? God does, absolutely. Uh, who tells Peter about the three men who go with him and don't hesitate? Don't worry, I send them. Who does that? The Spirit of God does. And who came on the people assembled and poured himself out while Peter was still preaching? God did. God's the catalyst. God's the one moving here. And the reason Peter and Cornelius end up together is because both of these men, and this echoes back to the story we looked at earlier with Philip and the Ethiopian, when your heart is in a posture to be led by the Spirit of God, when you're willing and open and available 
for God to lead you. When you're ready to do that, God will lead you and connect you with people. And maybe you think, I love that. I love that story. It's so powerful that the gospel and that the story of Jesus and that God's love that, that it just broke through those barriers and that, and that Cornelius and all his household ended up becoming followers of Jesus and were baptized in Christ. Maybe you sit here this morning and you're like, that is so cool, that's awesome. It would be so cool if God would do that today. It would be so cool if God would do that in my life. It would be so cool if God would do that for the people I'm praying for. Have you followed the news of this church over the past couple of weeks? Do you know what's been going on here? So, I get a text to a couple weeks ago. No, I'm sorry. This is a while back. This was like over a month ago. Shelly Drennan texted me. They went out to eat with Nellie Jones, a couple other people from church and around here. She texted me and she said, hey, we're out to, we're out to lunch with Nellie. And she, she's been asking questions about being baptized. She really wants to be baptized. And uh, can, we, can you connect with her? I'm like, uh, yeah, you bet. So we have Nellie, uh, we tried to find a time where we could meet with her. And it was Friday night down in our office down here, Gwen and I met with her. And uh, Nellie's not here this morning, is she? Uh, that's okay. Um, I wish she was here. If you ever get a chance, ask her. She tells the story better than I do. So anyways, we're sitting on our couch. I just want to get to know her. I met her when she first came here the first Sunday and got to know her a little bit. But I just wanted, I always like to just see where's your heart at. And I just want to talk with you and pray over you before you get baptized. So we were getting to know her and stuff. And in the midst of our conversation, Nellie goes, did I tell you the story about how I ended up here that Sunday? And I said, no, I haven't heard that story. She's like, well, let me tell you. And uh, Nellie lives kind of like halfway between here and Nova. And she, it was on her heart, I don't think, and I know, it was not on her heart, just out of her own will. This is how the Spirit of God works. It was on her heart to get back to church. She had allowed herself to just be disconnected from the church for a long time. And so there was a church, and I don't even know which one it is, but there's a church she had invited to come to in Anderson. And she was driving on the way to this church. I don't know where, I don't know which one it is. She's over here on 38th Street. That's over here. She's driving down 38th Street. And she said, I, I literally, I feel like God told me, turn here. And one of the interesting things about this building is we're tucked away in this neighborhood in that right? A lot of churches tend to be on a corner or on a main street. You can see them from a main street, like 38th. And you can see a journey from the main road if you peek through, but we're not on the main road. We're not visible. She's driving by on 38th, and she feels like God says, turn. And so she got in the turn lane, and she turned left on Fairview, and she comes to the stop sign, and right there is Journey Church. And she felt like God was like, this is where you need to be. And she pulled in, and we weren't having class that morning, so I was in the community room chewing the fat with Rick and Bill and Tony and the guys in there. And she walks in and she's like, hey, I'm looking, I'm looking to come to church here, look for the church. And we all jump up and we're like, come on, come on in. And it's just amazing, like, in the rest is history. Like, how does that happen if not from God? Like, she felt like God told her to turn. She, would, she didn't even know this church existed. And I'm so thankful that she is here. And if you haven't got to meet her yet, you need to meet her. Because she's a special lady. Um, but anyways, the Spirit of God. You see, man, I wish this stuff could still happen today. Wouldn't it be cool if the Spirit of God would guide people? Like he did back then, 2,000 years ago in Acts chapter 10. Wouldn't that be cool? He's still doing it. I believe with all my heart that the Spirit of God, just like with Cornelius and say and Sean saying, send three men over here. And just like Peter giving this vision 
I believe the Spirit of God is at work in her because her heart was seeking Him. And what does God say? You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be what? Found by you. I mentioned this a few weeks back. He's not playing hide and seek. He's playing seek to find you and seek me. He's not going to crush you. His arms are open. But it's always an invitation to come to him. He's not going to force that. And her heart was open, and the Spirit of God said, you need to come right here. And I believe that's because she needed to hear what was being preached on baptism. And, oh, it's just so cool. And then uh, Bill was baptized that same week. And uh, literally, I think within a, within a couple weeks, um, Clint Soden, uh, these two, I sit back here together, and uh, they know each other from work previously. And Clint texted me and said, hey, my friend Bill wants to talk with you about being baptized. I'm like, absolutely. So we connect. When I was sitting in the office at the same couch right there talking with Bill, um, Bill, what I kept hearing a lot over and over from him was, I just, really, God has been put, put this on my heart. His spirit, he kept talking about what the Holy Spirit's been doing inside of him. I kept hearing that over and over when I was talking to Bill. And then we've got these two so very lovely, wonderful sisters, Amber and Morgan. And Morgan, everybody I've talked to is like not in here. She's probably home. Is she helping with kids or something? Okay. So Morgan's down here serving and helping with kids. Uh, these two sisters that I've known since fourth and sixth grade, and a lot of you here, some of you that have been part of the church for a long time, you've known these girls since they were born. And, and uh, they were thinking about being baptized, and they were here for that 10 year anniversary that we had, and they ended up bringing it up and talking with Paul and Deanna about it. And here's the cool thing these two girls that have grown up together, neither one of them knew the other one. I mean, not a huge shock, but neither one of them knew the other one was thinking about making that decision here real soon. And then when they brought it up together, like, you were, you've been thinking about it too? Yeah, you were too? Yeah. And so these two girls who've grown up together decided to put on Christ in baptism together here the same day. Oh, and by the way, uh, my backpack's back there in Sounder. That prayer list, that prayer list of people that you want to come to Christ to be baptized, uh, there's a couple names on there from Deanna Ward. No shocker that it's her two daughters, Amber and Morgan Ward. And I'm highlighting names on there when they come to Christ. Got some highlights on there now. Remember when we started that list together? I'm never going to stop praying for those people. Your leaders, when we get together, we pray over that list. You're going to keep praying for that list because we believe in the power of God. We believe in the power of prayer. And we believe that God wants His children to come home today. We believe we want the same thing God wants. So we need to pray. And all four of those people ended up getting baptized in the same week. And none of them knew the other one came back. Man, but wouldn't it be cool if God would do what he was doing back in Acts chapter 10, 2,000 years ago with Cornelius and Peter? Come on. He's doing it now. He is doing it still. The Spirit of God that loves his children, and when that heart is seeking him, and when he's got servants that are willing to pray and willing to be available to connect the dots, when he's got Philips that can meet with Ethiopians, and when he's got Peters that can meet with Cornelius, and when he's got Ananias that can meet with Saul's, God's like, that's all I would meet. I said a few weeks ago, do not underestimate the power of two. That's all God needs. Somebody who is willing and has their heart open and saying, God, help me connect with somebody who wants to find you and somebody else who's seeking him. That's all he needs. His spirit is powerful. His spirit will say, turn left. His spirit will put on your heart. I really need to make this decision. His spirit will bring two daughters together that decide to baptize and neither one of them knew until that moment. That's God at work. He's still doing it today. He's still doing it today. His spirit is the same spirit, the spirit within us, the same spirit that has given Cornelius a vision and given Peter a vision. He's still doing miraculous. It's miraculous. And then Cheryl Harper's baptism, Bethany Hoffman's baptism. Oh my goodness, just talking with them. What am I hearing? I'm, I'm hearing God putting things on people's hearts. He's still doing it. What the spirit of God did 
2,000 years ago in Cornelius and Peter, he is still doing here today, here among us. All you need to do is be willing. All you need to do is pray. God will connect to things. And it may not happen when you want. I know that. We have this list that we're praying for. And you know what? A lot of you in here, you've been praying for people on that list a lot longer than we have as your leadership since you've given us those names. I know. i got people I've been praying for too. We, we wish it could just happen right away, right now. But we're dealing with the human heart. And as we know about God, he's not going to just overpower that's why we pray for people that have a soft heart, praying for people to be open to seeing him, praying for God to show himself to people, right? We want it to happen because we love people. Don't stop praying. Don't stop being available. Don't stop keeping your eyes and ears open for the Spirit of God to show up and connect you to someone. Don't stop thinking for one second that you are not Philip and God will not lead you over to say, hey, go stand by that chariot. He's not done doing that. You don't think that he would lead you guys to go sit with somebody in the cafeteria? You don't think he would do that? You don't think he would connect you with somebody at work for those of people who you got people to work with and you're like, these people irritate me. I can't stand these people. They're such a pain in the butt. Why do I work with people like this? Do you know one of the people that my dad ended up leading the baptism when he worked in the military and the Air Force was a guy that he worked in the same office with and they didn't get along. They didn't get along at first. Uh, I forget who didn't like him. I think my dad didn't like him or whatever, but um, they're still in the church today. They didn't come to Christ because my dad ended up bringing them. See, even people that you're like, oh, they drive me nuts. Watch the Spirit of God break down the doors. Jews and Gentiles don't belong in the same room together. They don't belong at the same table together. And God says, yes, they do. Watch this. He will break down barriers that you thought could never be broken now. You must believe. You must have faith. You must keep praying and keep making yourself available. Do not underestimate the power of what God can do. We have had people baptized in this church, and we have had, and this isn't new, by the way, because there have been several people that have been baptized over the years previous. He's still doing it. He is still doing it. I believe with all my heart. You keep praying. We keep praying. We keep making ourselves available. And we keep keeping our eyes and ears open for the next opportunity the Spirit might be leading. Worship team, you guys go ahead and make your way up here. And uh, so after this happens, this incredible thing happens, uh, Cornelius, his family members, his friends, they all come. God's starting a new church in Caesarea. Uh, <laughs> I love that. God, God's starting a church in Caesarea. You might like, watch this Caesar. Caesar, you got nothing. So uh, and he'll, he'll put him wherever, right? So anyways, uh, after that all happens, this is what happens, I'm trying to sum up Acts chapter 11. Peter gets back to Jerusalem. And when he gets back to Jerusalem, the Jews there, it says the believers criticized him. They said, you went to, no, sorry, he said, you went into the house? You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them? Peter replied, bro. He doesn't say bro, that man, man, but he's like, have I got a story for you? And he tells them the story of what God did. And this is what happens at the end of that. Uh, in verses 17 and 18 of Acts 11, it says this. After, at the end of the story, he says, so if God gave them the same gift he gave us, the Holy Spirit did poured out, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's place? God's doing something. One of my people stand in the way and give me a break, guys. Uh, these Gentiles are in because God says so. You want me to stand in his way? And you know what's cool? He tells them that. Almost the same words he uses here further back. And he says, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. And I'm like, Peter, you're right. Because when the Spirit of God is working in somebody's life, when their heart is ready, nothing can stand in the way. Nothing can stand in the way. Jew, Gentile, male, female, all are one in Christ, Paul says in Galatians, right? Everybody is in. The gospel is for everybody. So when God's at work, nothing can stand in the way. I'm convinced, man. It's amazing to see how God can work. No power, church, no power in heaven 
and hell on the earth, under the earth, can stand in God's way. None can. I'll go back up for a second before that sentence on, because we'll think the angels are all singing with me tonight. But uh, nothing can stand in God's way. You believe that? One of our one of our members here is uh, corresponded with somebody who's in prison right now, and uh, this person that's in prison, not not at all follow Jesus, not at all in the church, and they're in prison, and all of a sudden they're starting to seek God and they're being open to it, and they are corresponding with this person. I don't want to get names just because, but uh, it's like God's doing it. He's doing the same thing still. And so I'm praying for them. Um, don't underestimate it. Don't underestimate it. So I just, I hope that this lesson, I hope that that story of Cornelius and Peter, I hope you walk out of inspired today. I hope that maybe you see some people at work or at school or in your family a little differently. I hope that uh, you recognize that the Spirit of God will bust down any door that stands in the way when somebody's willing. He's not going to break down the door if they're not willing. But if somebody's willing, and one of his believers is willing to be led, he can break down any barrier to bring them to him so they can know his love and be found and be baptized. So keep your eyes and ears open. I hope you're inspired to walk out of here. Keep your eyes and ears open for him. Think about that when we sing this song. You know? I just I, I wanted us to do this song after this lesson because the lyrics of this song speak so much to the story of Peter and Cornelius and the book of Acts and what God's doing, but also in the story of the journey and what God's doing. So let's stand and sing this together.
I think he can do everything. Leanne is back there. You might have to remember about, oh, probably a year, year and a half ago, she did a devotional, communion devotional. She was in a wheelchair. You know what she told me a while ago? She started a job. Isn't that amazing? Father, we are really just, we just can't believe the power that you have. And we know, Father, from your word that we can learn of that power. And we can even see it in our own lives. We just ask, Father, that you would help us to share that power, share that gospel with others. Help us to look for those people that don't have you in their lives. Do everything that we can to teach you about the love of Jesus. Bless us, keep us in your love today, and help us always, always give you the glory for everything that we have. We pray in Jesus. Amen. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.